Hi, everyone. Hi, man. Hi, man. Okay, um, let's get started then. So um, I'm very happy today to have um, Yura Malitsky give a talk in our seminar. Um, Yura completed a PhD at the Talos Shevchenko of University of Kiev in 2015. Um, he actually got the Siam Best Student Paper Prize for work that he did in his PhD thesis for um, his reflected projected gradient algorithm, or for not, not gradient, but for variational inequalities, monotone variational inequalities. Um, after that, he went to the Technical University of Graz for a postdoc, which was followed by um, another postdoc in the University of Göttingen, where uh, we were colleagues. I was very fortunate to have you as a colleague there. He then moved to EPFL. Um, and then finally, last year, he moved to uh, Lindenshofen University in Sweden, where he is an assistant professor in the mathematics department. Um, if you have a look at his website, you'll see that he likes nice theorems, simple algorithms, and interesting applications. And maybe we can also add to that provocative titles for talks. Um, but I guess we're going to hear about all those things today. Um, and so you're I'm looking forward to your talk, so I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks for the nice talk. Good introduction. Uh, it's not provocative talk for the talk uh, title for the talk. It was provo provocative title for the paper, and I just copy pasted it. Uh, yeah. So today I will talk about my recent work uh, with Konstantin Mishenko. Uh, here is reference for those who will interested in more details. But basically, I will I will uh, talk about everything today that we covered in in, in, in the paper. Uh, in case you have some questions, please interrupt me immediately. Like, don't 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 wait until the end of the talk. Uh, in case you write something in the chat, I think Matt will help me uh, to, to to read the comment. Okay. Uh, so today we will study the simplest uh, optimization problem. We have a convex differentiable function f, and we want to minimize it. Like one cannot imagine something more complicated, uh, more, uh, simpler, something simpler than that. Uh, so how we are going to, to solve this problem? Since it's so so basic, definitely there are plenty of methods to do it. In, indeed, like right, there are gradient methods, there are accelerated gradient methods, more complicated Newton methods, even more complicated tensor methods, or like compared to gradient method, or otherwise like much simpler, like stochastic methods or coordinate one. For example, probably uh, one can uh, expand this list. But the most important algorithm here is like the, the, the mother of all algorithms is gradient descent. And uh, today talk will be just about gradient descent. We'll talk about uh, drawbacks, mostly about drawbacks and how to eliminate uh, those. Uh, so this is pretty old method uh from like middle of uh, 19th century as uh, so there are some list of cl cl classic works where people either prove convergence or uh propose some line searches and so on and so on uh here we will assume for now that uh we will interchangeably say that f is l smooth or which means it's a gradient is a Lipschitz, which is like standard uh standard uh, definition so we will use either the gradient is Lipschitz or the function is L smooth. And, and under this assumption, so if F is convex and L smooth and step size is chosen appropriately, uh, then it's, it's known we can, we can prove convergence to some of the minimizers. Uh, if you pick some concrete step size, lambda, for example, one over L, uh, then we can prove the following rate for the objective. For us, it's only important that it's one over k, uh, and probably it's it's good to remember that L uh, is in the nominator, the Lipschitz constant, the big Lipschitz constant, uh, the worst rate. This is like standard basic result from optimization. Okay, uh, I don't think there are some questions, so we will go further. Uh, also, we will talk about and uh, like. Um, the algorithms that we can implement uh, on the computer has to be discrete. It's still very useful to, 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 to consider the continuous viewpoint 
so if this is like a discrete gradient descent, so imagine we have a curve, a continuous curve that passes through all the iterates of uh, of our method of gradient descent, and we will denote uh, at at point lambda k, uh, we'll denote just x k just for simplicity. So uh, we can rewrite the scheme uh, above uh, in the following form, like yeah, like this one. Then it's obvious what we are going to do. We subtract, uh, divide over lambda, and have something like that. So if we, now if we, if we tend lambda to zero, we obtain the derivative of uh, x prime uh, equals to minus gradient. This equation is called gradient flow. It, so before it before we had a uh, we had an equation in the discrete point of times. Now it's continuous. So uh, and the image if we are, if we start from the blue point and we want uh, it's a level set of some two dimensional function and we want to minimize it uh, to find minimize the which is a red star. So continuous flow will be some uh, green curve. And uh, if you discretize it with some finite step size in some particular, uh, then we obtain some an, an, another like list of points. And you see, the, like uh, it, 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 they do not coincide, of course, it, because we from discretization we have uh, some error in every iteration. But still, like both both uh, both, uh, both iterates converge to the solution. So why do we need continuous equation? uh gradient flow because uh, it's always it's often it's often much simpler to uh, to analyze method uh, even the discrete one it it will it will help us to understand what what uh, should we consider as an energy um, what is the problems issue there and so on so in this case it's like just three lines and we have the proof uh, which actually leads to the proof of discrete case uh, usually, it's important to to find some Lapunov function to analyze uh, uh, differential equation. So, in, uh, how to pick it in this equation? But in this case, it's it's pretty simple. So, it's just a square norm. Uh, Lapunov function is a function which is uh, which is decreases along the uh, trajectories of our system. So, uh, which means. Uh, in other words, we have to we have to show that the derivative of this function is non-positive. Uh, that's what we are going to do. So we differentiate it, and by simple transformation. So we, uh, yeah, by simple transformation, uh, now we will use convexity. Uh, this is just says that uh, the tangent line is below the curve of convex function, uh, and since x star is a minimizer, we we have that it's uh, non-positive. So indeed, Lapinov function is uh, Lapinov function decreases along trajectories xt, and then by simple integration, uh, we can easily show that uh, xt converges to x star, and we even have the following rate. So, uh, so this is like three lines of proof, and we, we got all the result. We already see uh, which rate uh, with which rate it's one over t, right? It's the analogous of the previous rate for the discrete case one over k. Uh, this already indicates what we should get uh, in the discrete case. Unlikely we will get something better. It, 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 it would be very strange. And we see how the proof of convergence should work. Uh, yeah, so we just use convexity, some, something like that. Of course, it, it's, it's more complicated in, in, uh, because here we don't even use it, uh, the gradient is Lipschitz of the function. Uh, uh, we have to use, of course, that uh, the trajectory exists, and for this we need something like local Lipschitzness. But apart from apart from existence in the proof of convergence, we didn't use uh, uh, any any Lipschitzness or smoothness. Okay, so this is like just to remember, uh, so just to remember that the proof is very short and continuous uh, continuous, and it'll help us to derive proof for the discrete case. Uh, okay. But since it's discrete and we have this lambda, and lambda has to be smaller than uh, Lipschitz constant with some with some constant. Uh, in the continuous case, we didn't have this issue, so this is like the biggest issue. So, uh, for example, some functions can be non-smooth, uh, uh, for ex like uh, like exponential or logarithm, etc. Uh, yes, and it's a 
so it's like L is infinity for this function. Uh, and in this case, it's not clear how to pick uh, lambda, right? Because lambda has to be smaller than two or L. And uh, so that's like the, one of the issues. Uh, in any case, it's Lipschitz or not, we have to find this, this lambda. There should be some work, uh, there, there is some work to, to be done and maybe we have to run several times, maybe we have to solve some another sub problem to find this lambda. Uh, it's not for free. And uh, uh, it's not for free. And, and moreover, uh, if you pick lambda uh, larger than two or L, it's, it's very likely that the method will diverge. So we have to be careful. And, we, but, and we, it's not that it will diverge immediately. It can run for 100 iteration and only then start to diverge. So this is like a lot of work actually have to be done if we don't know the step size. It's a Lipschitz constant. And finally, um, but maybe also mm, very important that uh, if you use Lipschitz constants as a global constant, uh, uh, it, it, it can be very conservative. Uh, like if you start from from point x zero and converge to some x star, uh, we are actually in a small region of our of our domain. But Lipschitz constant is about uh, it's a global constant. It's about the full domain. Uh, so locally, maybe the Lipschitz constant we don't need to use a global Lipschitz constant. Maybe we can we could use something smaller. If you use smaller constants, we would be much faster. Uh, but if you use only global information, it cannot. So that's that's another issue. Okay. Uh, yeah. So these these are the, the the main issues, and let's see uh, what is known and how people uh, attack these these ones. So of, of course the algorithm is pretty old. So apparently there are many many approaches uh, have to tackle them. So first uh, we need to guess what is lambda. Uh, the best solution would be just to use line search. What is line search is like we, we, if we don't, we, if you have no idea from which point, uh, which step size to choose, we just try something. Uh, in this case, like uh, so, we will write like uh, another loop in every iteration. Uh, we start from let's say lambda uh, from gamma to the power of zero, which is one, and uh, uh, do gradient descent step and check if some condition uh, holds. For in this case, it's uh, if our objective decreases sufficiently or not. If, it's, uh, if it decreases sufficiently, then we accept the step size and go to the next iteration. If uh, this inequality does not hold, we increase, uh, yeah, we increase, uh, well, sorry, we decrease lambda and again run the same gradient descent. Uh, so, it's pretty reliable, but the only drawback is that it's more expensive, right? In a, now, in every iteration, we have to run several, possibly several of these sub iterations, and in every in each of it, we have to compute energy, f x k, f x k plus one, so on. So it's just a bit more expensive. Uh, okay, gradient descent is slow in terms in that it uses this global information. Uh, one of the solution is to use Pollack step size. Pollack step size is uh, the following. Then we know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very efficient, but of course uh, we have to know f star. It has to be exact. It, uh, we, we cannot this approximation. It will not work uh, so well. So not so many problems, unfortunately, where we know f star in advance. Usually we don't know this value, but if we know probably the best thing to do would be to use Pollack step size. Uh, okay, there is another very popular Barzilai Borvain step size, uh, but we, we just, so yeah, this is the following uh, approximation of lambda k, but unfortunately uh, we have theoretical guarantees only for quadratic f and in general for like some simple convex, even strongly convex function, uh, we have these simple counterexamples. So it's a not a uh, it's a it's a good procedure, but it's not reliable uh, even for convex functions. Okay. Now we will. Uh, so this were the issues, and now we will 
will uh, remember as how the standard analysis of gradient descent works. Uh, you don't need to follow like very very carefully here. I will just give a big picture. Uh, but on slides there will be all, uh, there will be all the proof if you want to to see it later um, in more details. So if you want to, uh, there are many things what we can prove in gradient descent. If we know if we want to prove convergence of iterates xk to x star and rate. Uh, this is uh, what we should do. There are like three ingredients. We will use like Pyth Pythagoras theorem or law of cosines. Uh, we have to use convexity. The inequality is that the tangent is below the, uh, the convex function. And we will need smoothness as the gradient is Lipschitz. Uh, since function is convex, uh, actually we don't need it, uh, Smoothness can be written equivalently as a descent lemma. And if function is convex, it's, it's uh, basically equivalent. Uh, yeah, okay. So this like us, this are the three ingredients. And now having gradient descent, we'll just substitute our iterates into this identities or inequalities, sum up them and obtain proof. This is how it works. Now it will be a bit heavy slide. Uh, so this is our uh, equation. These are our three ingredients. And what we are doing right now, we will just substitute. Uh, yeah, so law of cosines, right? It's clear, like we transform just xk plus one minus x star, expand this, the square norm, change, and have the following uh, expression. Same for convexity, and same for descent lemma, for smoothness. Uh, yeah. You don't need to follow, it's not so important, and probably all of you have seen this many times. Uh, okay, so what, what we are going to do next? We have these three inequalities, we sum up these three equalities, inequalities, and obtain the following, in particular if we choose lambda smaller than one or L. Uh, yeah, maybe it, it, might, it might remind you of something, something different. Uh, so in the continuous case, if you remember, we had the following inequality. It's very, very similar to the above. If, if I introduce some notation, like CK in the discrete case and C of T in the continuous case, it's like the same energy. Then the energy is even uh, more apparent. Uh, like in the left, left-hand side, we'll have a, a discrete. Uh, the energy for the inequality for the discrete case in the right hand side you'll have inequality for the continuous case so pr pretty similar the only difference basically is that oh sorry that lambda is present in the continuous case we didn't care about lambda uh, okay so this was an old classical approach uh, but we have to we had to know this lambda and now we will we will t uh, talk about something completely different. Okay, uh, twenty minutes. Okay, I just check my time. Uh, so um, F is smooth, which means the gradient is Lipschitz, and our, our goal is to estimate this lambda based on some local properties of uh, of F. Probably the most intuitive thing you can do is just to uh, uh, to run gradient descent and to estimate local Lipschitzness based on current gradient and previous one, and say that your, your step size lambda k is just one over LK. This is the, the simplest thing you can do, right? It's even simpler than uh, partial bar vein step size. Uh, unfortunately, it will not work. You, you will find some counterexample for uh, convex counterexample where the method will, will diverge. But uh, the correct method, at least the method we, we propose, is not that different from that one. So th the method on the left will not work. But the method on the right, the one we propose, will, will work reliably. And so let's, let's see how much it's different. Uh, we have the same gradient descent where lambda k is computed a bit differently. Uh, we, we, as well, we compute the local Lipschitzness, same as previously, but we add the step size lambda k is not just one over LK, it's one over two LK in our case, but most importantly, we have some safeguard. We don't allow lambda to increase too much 
from iteration to iteration. This th theta k minus one approximately is close to one. You can you can think of it because it's lambda k over lambda k minus one, so it's close to one. So <clears throat> we allow it to increase in square root of two times, roughly speaking, uh, but but not more. So this is a safeguard. The method will uh, will will work. We, we don't understand if it's like mandatory or not. Uh, but from the proof, it, it came na naturally. So it's, we will see in a moment how it works. Uh, any questions so far? So the, yeah. the whole method is just for four lines, but we, we will talk in more details later why, why it works. Yeah, cool. Hi, Yura. Um, big fan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious um, in regards to your minimum function there. So, so the left-hand term stops it from, uh, puts a limit on it getting too large, I suppose. And the lambda k, the, we, we, we have a, um, a proof for it that says that it won't get too small, the one over two lambda k, uh, l k, sorry. Uh, yes, it, that's a good question. And later we will see, it, it, uh, it will, because it's l k, constant l k is always, uh, not smaller than global L Lipschitz, right? So uh, cl global L would be the, the same expression, but just it, it has to hold for all x. Uh, and here L k local uh, local constant of Lipschitz, L k. Of course, it's it's smaller because it it is satisfied only at two points x k and x k minus one. So one over two L k is always bigger than one over two L. So in the worst case, uh, our step size will be always one over two L. Let's say if we have a quadratic function, a uh, quadratic function with identity uh, matrix. In this case, the, the Lipschitz constant is always one, but because we use this, uh, this procedure, uh, this ad ad adaptivity, it says it's just one over two L. So we will not we will not gain anything, of course. But it's extreme case, it's like not not interesting. Yeah, cool. So that, that's that's essentially the distinction. Um, it, it being locally Lipschitz uh, constant as opposed to the global Lipschitz constant means that you're not going to have that um, uh, stopping or slowing down. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. If it, it's it's because this local is always uh, smaller, not not bigger than the global one. So the step size will never be smaller, like sm more than in two times smaller than original. That's 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 very important for us to get rate of conversions. Okay, uh, so uh, let's let's discuss in more details how the algorithm works, so that you you will remember it better, and we will can discuss its proof. So in the iteration k, uh, we are given the previous iteration xk, uh, the, pre uh, the current iteration xk, previous gradient uh, at point xk minus one, and some parameter theta k minus one, which is close to one, roughly speaking. So what we are doing, uh, we compute gradient, uh, gradient at current point, and uh, compute constant lk. It's constant lk is cheap because it's just current gradient, which we already computed, and previous one, which we store. Uh, very simple and like not expensive. Then we compute lambda k again. It's, it's a very uh, very cheap procedure. This is lambda k. We compute new iteration, new iterate x k plus one, and update uh, our parameter theta k. So in terms of cost, uh, it's usually the only expensive uh, part is computing the gradient. And it's not that different from the original gradient descent, right? The same one gradient per iteration and some extra simple calculations. So this is the algorithm. Uh, okay, so why it's adaptive, I think is clear. Uh, uh, because we don't need to do any work to, to find the step size lambda k, right? Lambda k adapts more or less to local geometry of uh, your function. Uh, still, it's uh, gradient descent. 
uh, yeah, because it's just it's the same gradient descent with this procedure to find good lambda k. Uh, but <clears throat> but why uh, why it doesn't have any descent? Uh, yeah, because we cannot guarantee that the objective will decrease in every iteration. We don't have this property. That's why it's basically this, uh, gradient descent without descent. Uh, okay. So why the method works? Uh, I just wrote it in a different way. Without constant LK, I substituted directly this expression here. So why the method works? Uh, in our proof, uh, we came up with like a quite different energy. If you remember, the energy for classic analysis of gradient descent was just a first term, xk plus one minus x star. Here we have some extra terms. So it's another question how to find this energy, but assume we have it, how the proof should work. Uh, as before, we want, to, we want to show that the energy is decreasing, or at least not, not, not increasing. Uh, if you start to write, if you like substitute this ck plus one and ck and start to, to see if you have extra terms or not, we obtain something like ugly. We obtain one term in the big brackets and another term. Now, if you look closer to the uh, to the one term, uh, so like the one ugly term gives us uh, the red one, gives us exactly the condition uh, on lambda k and local Lipschitzness. We of course we want to have this ugly term uh, non negative. Uh, uh, no, sorry, negative. Uh, so we have to ensure that lambda k is not bigger than this expression. Similar with the second, uh, yes, similar with the second term, we want to ensure that it's negative. So we cannot take lambda k is too big. We have to ensure that it it it, it will not increase too much. If it increases too much, then this term can be uh, positive, and we will not have it decreased. That's basically how these two strange at first glance condition arise. Right? It just just because, of course, maybe maybe you, you, it's possible to come up with different energy, but with uh, similar properties for for adaptivity for step size. We just don't know. Uh, okay, uh, what we can prove? So now we assume that function is only locally Lipsch, uh, has locally Lipschitz gradient. Uh, I, in a moment, I will tell uh, what it is. So in this case, we can prove that, uh, as, as before, that uh, iterates converge to the minimizer. And the, for some ergodic sequence xk, the following rate holds. Some constant divided over sum of step sizes. And it's also 1 over k. So first, lip, local Lipschitzness, it's Lipschitzness in some bounded uh, set, set some, some all these bad uh, functions, like highly nonlinear, they, they're all local Lipschitz. And why the step size is bounded, we already discussed this. Uh, so we can prove that lambda i is always bigger than one over two l, and l l i is always bigger, smaller than uh, constant uh, one or uh, than l. So that's why we have one over k, right? But in practice, it's it has to. It, it, it's I think it's clear that since we can use much bigger step sizes. Uh, also for theoretical rate, like a priori rate, we, ha we have to rely on this conservative bound. Lambda i is just bigger than one over two L. That's why we have one over K. But since in practice we can use much bigger, we, we can get much bigger step sizes, uh, the rate can be also much better. It's just not clear how to prove it in advance without knowing uh, the lambda. Uh, okay, this is all for, for the theory. So if you have any questions, please ask it's better to ask now, maybe, because later it will be something different. Okay, no, no question. Okay. Are you, uh, I have a question. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, is there an initial condition on the first lambda? How to choose this? Uh, or just greater I than mean, zero? Uh, well, let me think. Um, so. Um, okay, so in initial lambda has to be reasonable only, I mean, for theory, 
we, we don't care. For, for practice, of course, since we start from some lambda and, we, and the consecutive lambda depends somehow on this previous lambda, on the initial one, yeah, because we don't allow to increase too, like too much from lambda zero. Uh, so of course it, it matters in practice. Say if you take lambda zero is 10 to the, pi, to the power minus 10, of course, it's it's not good, right? It's like it, it means that all consecutive iterate uh, step size will be also small. Uh, so it has to be reasonable. What we what we do? We first uh, we first pick some. Uh, let's say we have x star uh, uh, x zero. In the neighborhood of x zero, we find another point. Let's say x minus one, and based on these two local based on these two iterates, we find a step size like local local mm -hmm. and and say this is our lambda zero okay and so it's just like it somehow approximates our local lipsiousness and based on it we we run the method okay thanks mm -hmm. uh okay uh how it works so we run it for logistic regression with l2 regularizer we compare it with gradient descent like basic gradient descent with a fixed uh, step size one over L and uh, with uh, Nestor accelerated gradient descent. So of course Nestor accelerated is much better than gradient descent. It has theoretical better rate and we, we see this uh, in practice for this data set, it, it works much, much better. We don't have one over K square rate. We have the same rate as gradient descent. The only advantage of our method is uh, that we can use much bigger s step sizes without any extra computation. So with this, with this uh, at least on this data set, we can be easily uh, both uh, accelerated and standard gradient descent. So this is why it's important somehow. Even without this acceleration, only using bigger step sizes, we still converge much, much faster uh, than classical methods. Uh, okay. In the strongly convex regime, uh, strongly convex, uh, what, we, what we know is so that gradient descent complexity, of course, we have linear rate uh, where L and mu uh, is global, again, global constant on the whole domain. Uh, in our case, we will also have this linear rate, but we will have it with L prime mu prime. Uh, and this constant are, are local. So this, we care about this constant only on the convex domain of our iterates, x0, x1, until x star. So of course this, subs, this set is smaller than the whole domain. And because of that, L prime and mu prime are, um, mu prime is bigger and L, L prime is uh, smaller. So the ratio is, uh, will be smaller small ratio is a, is a, is a better rate. Uh, but again, we cannot say a priori how, how, how much they will, will be small. It's just intuitively for us to understand that why the method can perform much better. So in this regime, uh, it's a strongly convex regime because we can use local, local constants. Okay. If you don't have any theoretical questions, now we, uh, we go to the heuristic areas which may be even more interesting i think uh you're, i think there's yeah. one question in the chat uh yeah, yeah. Your, Please. uh graph that you just showed the questions from chris Swan. yeah just just me again um i'm just wondering about the time per computation um so the iterations adaptive is fairly similar but the nestrov and adaptive have similar um computation time uh all three methods it's it's a big it's a big uh, data set, so the only expensive uh, operation there is computing gradient because it requires two metrics vector multiplication. And uh, it's a pretty large, pretty large metric, so all, so all three methods have just one gradient per iteration. So right. this, is, this is what we report. There are some extra addition or subtraction, but this is like neg negligible. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I just know that, um in, in uh, using line search in comparison to these things, looking at iterations can lie a little bit because line search will seem to re reach it quite quickly, but... Um, no, no, but there, there, there is no line search. Uh, yeah, 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 right. For gradient descent and Nestor, we just use fixed 
uh, step size. We, uh, we do have, uh, yeah, we do have line search in our paper, to, including this, this, uh, uh, this problem, for example, and we included computation of gradients in, this, in that case. So right, right, right. The, the comparison was, was fair. You, I think there are many more plots in the paper. You, you can look into them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This line search of, yeah, we, we are better, but like, of course, not, not in that, not that much. Like usually we like, we are better in two, three times than line search. Yeah, but this, this is a valid observation. Of course, we, we have to, like, if you do line, line search, we have to take in, into account the number of gradients. Or uh, sometimes it's not just gradients, it's also objective. So, like, just matrix vector multiplication, say. Good. Uh, now, heuristics. Uh, so, if function is strongly convex, again, and else smooth, uh, the best gradient descent method is again uh, like Nestor one, best in the sense that uh, it has the following rate and it, it it cannot be improved. So gradient descent complexity is uh, as we've seen already, and accelerated will be square root of this condition number of l over mu. Usually n over mu is a big number, so taking square root of it, it helps a lot. So it's again it's very similar to gradient descent. We just will just use this momentum term. Uh, in, instead of uh, standard uh, X game. Uh, okay. Uh, so from from our method, uh, just for creating descent, we now have to estimate locally this constant L, right? And like have to have to have the safeguards to ensure that everything will work. Uh, what about mu? Uh, so mu is a constant of uh, strong convexity constant. We know that f is mu, mu strongly convex if and only if, uh, where the conjugate f is one over mu smooth. So, and but we now have to have to estimate smoothness very well. So we don't. So for for strongly con convexity parameter, we we didn't because it's something completely different. But if you go to the dual domain and consider conjugate, then this constant becomes basically against the smoothness. So we can do the same trick as we did for our method, just in the dual domain. And combine these two approaches and we will estimate this beta parameter. So that's, that's basically the idea. Uh, next slide will be ugly. So, but the, this is the idea how, how we are going to do it. Uh, so for for lambda, like the small letters lambda k and theta, it's the same that we had before, and we use capitalized letters lambda and theta for the same in the dual domain. Uh, so in the dual domain, gradients are right now like primal points, and iterates x k are like uh, like inverse for them. So we can est estimate this beta beta k now, and do the same of what Nestor does. Uh, yeah, and if you if you apply it to the same problem, we will have even even so it's the same logistic regression that we used before. We will we will see even much faster conversions. Uh, of course, of course, we have no proof for, for this method. Like no no idea how to approve, but I think it it reliably worked for all all test problems we tried, and we couldn't manage to find any counterexample. So at least if you're interested to, to see if it works uh, on some difficult problem you, you like to try, please. We will, we will be also happy to get a counterexample, at, at least like for convex function. Uh, yeah. Uh, why yep. is the theta k divided by two in the square root when you choose lambda k instead of uh, uh, Good observation, right? It was just one over theta k. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think we just observed in uh, in we, we try to play with these parameters. So I, I think it worked with one as well. Just with two, it was either I think it performed better. Somehow that's why we we picked two. Uh, 
Uh, so, like, so, so it's we, come we, from we, a numerical experiments. Yeah, like we we run for many test problems with different parameters here and find that like this two is like performed the best. I mean, I see. So it, of course, before we could use any parameter here, yeah, because it's like a safeguard. If it, if 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 we use a more conservative uh, safeguard, it's it's fine. The convergence will will work as well without acceleration, just with standard gradient descent. So it's not a big deal. Uh, usually we want we want to be uh, we want to increase the size as much as we can from iteration mm -hmm. to iteration. But of course we are fine even not to increase it. The convergence will also be in place. Uh, but here, I, my, since it's just a heuristic, we, we find, find that with, if we like not so aggressive, it, it was better. I see. Because it, it was too specific, so I was thinking maybe it's linking to the, uh, the proof technique but you don't have a proof no, 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 of no, no. We, don't we don't have like in the next heuristic you will see we, we again have something similar okay, okay. thank you mm -hmm. so now uh when you have gradient descent uh of course you can you you would like to try any any possible extension uh you can like apply to some real world problems uh, and in real world problem stochastic gradient descent is the most popular method so far so if you want to minimize the sum of many, many, many terms, uh, just computing one gradient will be too expensive. So in every iteration, uh, now we sample just one index or subset of indices. Right now, let's say it's just one index and compute grade and do gradient descent only for this uh, index uh, CK. So this is basic SGD. Uh, so in, in theory, Lambda, in order to have convergence, lambda k has to decrease to zero with some specific rate. Uh, but in practice, we just uh, we just fix some lambda k, um, and so some small one, and and use it. Or we we fix it, uh, use for some number of iterations and decrease it again, fix and so on, so on. There are many procedures you have to do it. But, okay, so what we are going to do, since it's very similar to gradient descent. We again are going to estimate this lambda k based on local properties. So adaptive SGD. Same with sample CK. Uh, now we compute local Lipschitzness LK, but here's like some attention is needed. Uh, we have to compute this gradient. We have to like compute it in the previous point because in the previous point we, we use different gradient. Uh, uh, with a different sample, so now, uh, f so in order to estimate LK, we have to we have to compute two gradients, and if you know LK, we compute lambda K. Also, also like we have some safeguards here, some parameters beta alpha, which we, which will be tuned in the experiment. So we want to be as general as possible. We don't know which alpha beta, let's say here is the best, and, and do standard gradients descent for this ck function so it's 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 basically the same what uh, gradient descent just with our procedure to find lambda k uh yep and strangely but it works for uh, so we tried it for for training neural networks and it 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 works somehow uh, pretty well i mean so this is our choice for step size lambda k uh, with some specific uh, with some specific alpha beta, uh, we got the following results. So it was ResNet. Uh, we compare with stochastic gradient descent and, uh, and uh, I think momentum SGT. Uh, yeah, I, I I can imagine it's it might be difficult to look. So uh, for example, in the second plot, the the red curve, uh, like from around 200 iteration they are much better for example than sgd state of the art uh, on this uh, on this problem uh, of course i report the results in terms of epoch but one uh, uh, one epoch for us is in two times more expensive than the same for sgd yeah because we, we have to compute two gradients in every iteration two small gradients so it's it's not just it's not so correct but still it's nice that 
uh, we see some improvement. Moreover, if we, if we check the step size, which is in machine learning called learning rate, uh, we see that uh, the, the step size is like black and red, uh, uh, indeed increased to, to which is like quite quite counterintuitive for what people are doing in machine learning. So from in machine learning in SGD, this is like a very popular regime. You start from some step size, like for for one hundred iteration, you you do this uh, epochs. You you use SGD with this step size and you decrease step size and so on. This is how it works. In our case, if if you do what we did, step size increase like a lot, and we, we have no exp no idea why it works. But in many many problems we, we tried, it worked reliably well. Uh, okay. I Quick question. I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what happens with the red line after two hundred epochs for the learning rate? Uh, uh, I think uh, it looks like it stops. Yes, it looks like stop. I mean, of course, I cannot answer right now. Uh, yeah. I, I I think maybe that was it. It becomes too. I think it became too small, and that's why maybe we have so stable for test accuracy regime. I I have no idea. Ah, right okay. Now, I see. Maybe it moves below ten to the minus three. Yeah, yeah, maybe, but uh, yeah, but I uh, prop. It's like it's it's become too small, so it's like just like okay, no, and yeah. we, we just don't don't see it in the plot. I mm -hmm. don't know why. I don't know why it jumps. Of course, that's another question. But that, that's what I saw in your GitHub, Euro. Um, that it just yeah, yeah, I know, I know, and I think it it coincided with it coincided with the. Uh, moment where it, it like st stabilized the trajectory becomes very stable mm -hmm. so maybe it's interesting uh okay so so Yura, is it is the the extra cost of computing to gradients significant or is it i mean, more it's, negligible? It's, what do you mean? it's not significant it's just like exactly in two times more expensive than than like standard sgd I mean, it's compared with, with what's significant, like sample, computed one gradient and now computed two gradients, right? It's just in two times more expensive. Sure. And for the experiments, do you use uh, SGD or mini batch actually? But uh, I, 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 I don't remember. I think it's like, uh, if you, as, uh, we call SGD also if it's mini batch, it's just your sample, yeah. not one, not one index, yeah. but like a, a few of them. It's it's not that important. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we, we, we also call it SGD. Uh, yes. Okay. So let me conclude with some open questions. Uh, okay, we have some evidence that accelerated version works, but we have no really no understanding why it works, or at least counterexamples that it, it does not work. If you have no idea how to do mirror descent, so everything today was uh, using Euclidean metric, and it would be very interesting to see whether it's possible to do for mirror descent case okay, with Bregman, more general distances. Uh, yeah, in the non-convex case, we have we have like some test problems where it works pretty well, but in terms of theory, it's not clear what what it, what it, uh, we can prove. Yeah, and for for practitioners, of course, it would be interesting to get some. Right now, we still have to tune this alpha and beta parameter parameter for SGD, so it it would be better to have like fully, uh, un, like some like uh, ready to use methods uh, for training neural networks. Uh, yeah, I think this is this is all what I have for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Please ask me some questions. Thanks, thanks very much for your talk, Hira. Um, so I guess if anybody has questions, uh, you can go ahead and, and unmute and ask them. I have one for the moment then. Um, if we go back to the beginning, you were talking about the 
relationship between the continuous dynamical system and the ingredient descent. And you, you mentioned about, yeah, like, so at the top here, you mentioned how you set X of lambda K to be X K. Um, so for the adaptive method, it's something like X lambda K K because X K, or is there like a, a clear connection there? Or it's a bit fuzzy. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we tried. We try to understand the connection of our adaptive step size to the continuous. Uh, so in this case, of course, lambda will will be like we have to include lambda, right? We have in the continuous case we just ignore it, but right now we have to uh, we have to use it. Uh, but we obtained some ugly some ugly differential equation, and we, we didn't it, like we, we we hope that it will it. Explain, it would explain us some intuition why, why the method works, why we have this energy, uh, like like beautify our more or less like strange uh, analysis in the discrete case. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case. So the, the differential equation was too bad, and we don't we didn't know how to proceed further. So it was like the opposite case that that we hoped. We we, we it's, and I still have no idea uh, because it's. Step size, the step size issues arise naturally from discretization. It's not clear. It's not clear if you go back and say, okay, now we have a continuous, uh, continuous scheme where already some lambda is present. Maybe it's, it's uh, something different. So it's it's not clear to me if, if one can do something or not for that. But but yeah yeah it, uh, okay we can add this like as another open question probably. It's just like I'm not so sure that it's possible at all to do. To... Yeah. Thanks, thanks. I think uh, Janos, are you your mm -hmm. what, Yeah. What I find very um, surprising is that I mean, you are basically using the last two gradients, or uh, in order to guess the local Lipschitz constant. But what you're interested in is the local Lipschitz constant in a totally different direction. Yeah. So you're comparing the gradients in the last direction. And uh, if you're in a very high dimensional space, for example, um, then this may tell you absolutely nothing about the next direction, about the behavior of the gradient in, in another direction. Uh, no, why? Uh, I mean, first. Uh, First, I, I, why why do we need uh, you know why why do you say that uh, we need uh, local Lipschitzness for the next and not for the previous one? I think it's not so different. We are it's a great descent that uses some. We are always in some neighborhood, right? In the XK, the mm -hmm. gradient is locally Lipschitz. So somehow it still gives us uh, some esti estimate of of it. Of course, it's a, not a true. Uh, yeah, but you see, you're overestimating, and you have no control how far you're overestimating, and then you're even changing the direction. I'm not saying that there's something wrong. I mean, you have a proof. No, no, no. But why, why, <laughs> I why, why, why I change direction? I use the same direction, the gradient fxk. I just say how far I can go with this direction. The direction yeah, but, is always the same. But to estimate L, you use the gradient you had previously and the gradient now. So you're comparing along the last step. Yes. And that is a different direction from the direction I go now. And that is surprising that this works, that the prediction I mean, from I see, last, I see. Yeah. It, would, it's, it's this more intuitive if we would use uh, next, uh, next iteration, right? Yeah. Because we are moving to, uh, forward to it. OK, yes, you're right. Uh, and I'm, that's, I'm not saying that this is something bad. I mean, it's something good because it is unexpected and it works, you know? And um, and could you could you uh, go to the slide with the um, with the energy again? Because maybe maybe it's possible to see something there. Okay, so that is the energy. Oh, but the energy is is changing. So it's, it it has both x k and x k plus one terms. Right. Yes. It's, it's a bit weird. Yes, and also you have the theta in there. I mean, is that the same energy for every single step? Of course. But, uh, I mean, you, you have to change index k, of course. 
but it's it's the same. You you know, you're proving that so ck plus one is smaller than ck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it, it has this like square root standard term, well, some uh, some energy for objective, and then some extra residual term. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will have to look at this. Is that uh, is that uh, um, somewhere on the archive or something? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, so, there was a reference. It's okay. Beginning. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you come up with that energy function, Shura? Okay, so I, I think I learned how to present this stuff. Of course, I didn't come up with this, uh, with this energy. I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's possible, right? It's it's so weird. Like how you come up can come yeah. up with with this energy with such weird parameters, theta and like lambda k. No, no, it was uh, so. It, it it was a bit different, I think. Uh, so there is a paper golden ratio algorithm, uh, which also uses adaptive step size, but for uh, variational inequalities for mm -hmm. for monotone operators, like more complicated. And I realized that. Okay, so it's probably I don't. Uh, monotone operators are too generic, and and when we have convex function, uh, like like gradient instead of just generic monotone operator, maybe we can use convexity somehow. Maybe it will help us to get something better. So in in because this method is still similar to uh, to the style of uh, golden ratio algorithm, but we don't need we we can use just current x k. And in, in that method, we had to to go back somehow, to to ensure to the previous points. So, but the idea came from that paper. I just like so the, the, the energy in the golden ratio is not trivial at all. Of course, of course. But because here we use convexity, we rely on convexity. Mm -hmm. It's a crucial, crucial ingredient. Before we didn't use any convexity stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not that I wrote this, we wrote this uh, energy and started to prove. No, no, we just, uh, we have proof and this energy uh, like appeared naturally. Mm -hmm. so that's how it was. Okay, nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think there's a question in the, the chat now from Hu Sheng Bai. Uh, the, the question is about how the, your proposed method compares to conjugate gradient. I think it's let's say like it's completely different methods. Uh, uh, I, I don't think how, uh, I, I cannot understand how you will apply conjugate gradient for let's say logistic regression. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure that if you if you compare it with for quadratic function, I think conjugate gradient would be would be better. Uh, but for some nonlinear convex function, I have no idea, and I, I don't have much experience with conjugate gradient method. So don't know. Okay. Uh, so, are there any final questions then? Um, in oh, yeah. okay. in in your stochastic case, um, uh, why do you need uh, to choose alpha and beta? Uh, why do you need to add more parameters there? Because I mean, these problems are not that easy, right? It's like it has like millions of parameters. It's it's, it's very complicated, and so if we just want to be like as flexible as possible. So it's easy to it's easy for us to fix some alpha beta, but then we test not rest net, but let's say dense net, and for this uh, for this data set. Uh, uh, we will, we will have like worse result for those alpha beta. So we just want it to be as general as possible to play to play with them. So if you see here, it's like alpha beta in the plots is like 50 or 0 0.5 and so on. So we, 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 it was quite extensive search for finding good parameters. We don't understand, of course, why, but this is what we have. Okay, so it's come from uh, experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, just, just true. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, then I think it's, uh, we've, we've now hit the hour. So I think that's a, probably a good time to finish, but we had a, a good discussion. Um, so thanks again, Yura.
Thanks, uh, Alex. It was a pleasure. Uh, and Thanks, we will post the video on the conference, uh, the conference, the, the seminar webpage. So uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you, Yura. Thanks, Yura. It was Thank a real you, Yura. Pleasure.